This is the Jumper T16, and I'm in the process of making it my new daily driver radio. And that means I get to make a whole bunch of new great educational content for you about this radio. Today, what we're going to learn how to do is create a new model in the radio and bind that model to a new quad and just basically get the radio set up with a new quad so that we can fly the quad and have a great time. I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. The quad that we're going to be working with in this video is this little Beta FPV HX115. But don't let the fact that we're working with a micro quad worry you at all. The steps for setting up the quad are identical, whether you're working with a little micro, a 5-inch, or a giant beast class. They all fly the same, and the steps for setting up is the same. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to long press the jog wheel, and I'm going to go to Model Select, and I'm going to long press the jog wheel again, and I'm going to create a new model. Now you may have noticed there was already a model in my radio. It was named Nazgul. That's, that's this quad here. I'm working on reviewing it, but that's not really relevant today. You don't actually have to create a brand new model for every single quadcopter that you own. And in fact, I recommend that you don't. There's nothing inherently wrong with it, although your radio does get a little cluttered. And especially as you like lose one or you crash it or you sell it or you, whatever, it just gets a little bit hard to manage. The real reason I don't think you should make a new model for every single one of your quads is that it makes changing the models really unwieldy. Let's say that you set up your arming switch right here on the upper left. And then one day, for some reason, you decide you want your arming switch to be this one. Okay, that's no problem. That's easy to do. But if you have 15 different models, one for each of your quads, you'll need to make that change on all of the models. And that's a real pain in the butt. And that's a bigger deal than it seems like because muscle memory and mental conditioning is a really important part of safe flying. You're going to train. This is your physical interface to your quad. And then you're going to train your fingers, your hands, and your brain to work with it a certain way. And if you make changes and then the disarm switch isn't where you expect. Imagine that in your car, suddenly the brake pedal wasn't on the left anymore. It was on the right and you had to stop suddenly you could do the wrong thing. So keeping your models consistent is very, very important. And the simplest way to do that is to just have one model and set up all your quadcopters exactly the same. Well, it's not quite that simple. It turns out that sometimes quadcopters are different enough that you have to have a different model for them. And the main thing that differentiates them is the receiver. So if you've got one quadcopter with a free sky receiver and one quadcopter with a spectrum receiver, you would need a different model for those two quadcopters. But you could have one model for all your free sky receivers, one model for all your spectrum receivers. And you would still want to set those up exactly the same, especially as regards to functions like arm and disarm and other safety related functions. But you don't need one model for every single one of your quads that you definitely don't need to do. Just for the sake of this demonstration though, I'm going to create a new model just for this quad. Now my radio has popped up this helpful <laughs> wizard asking me if I've got a glider or a plane. Uh, none of the above. I'm just going to back out of that wizard. We're just going to set it up manually. You don't need to worry about that. I'm going to back out by hitting the return key. Now this check mark right here tells me that this model is selected. That's the one I'm working with. I'm going to hit the return key one more time to get to the main screen and then I'm going to hold down the model key. And that is going to bring us to the model setup. And the first thing I can do is I can rename this model. And I'm going to do that. You can see that the name is highlighted. I'm going to highlight it and click one time. And let's just name this Beta HX115. So I can roll to select a letter, B. It's going to take a minute. Here we've got a lowercase h, but I want an uppercase h. I can switch that by long pressing the jog wheel. And you, what I did there is if you really quickly spin the jog wheel, it just goes all the way to the end really quickly. And then I'll hit return. And there we go. We've named it. You know what? No. Uh, I'm going to do it the way that you should actually do it instead of this like special way that I'm only doing it because I'm making a tutorial. This is how you should actually don't name it the name of your quad. What you should do is this. I'm going to name this F Free Sky 
FreeSky D16. And this is going to be the model that you're going to use for all of your FreeSky D16 protocol receivers. Any quad with that receiver in it is going to use this model. And all the quads are going to be set up exactly the same so that all the switches do the same thing on each of them. And you're just going to have one model for all the quads. The next thing we're going to need to do is put the receiver into bind mode. Before we do that, binding, what is binding? The binding is how the receiver knows that this transmitter is the one it should be listening to. When you're out at the field and all your friends are flying at the same time, all their transmitters are transmitting at the same time, how does the quadcopter know which transmitter it's receiving its commands? Who is my pilot? Binding is how it knows that. So you need to bind a receiver to a transmitter, and that's pretty much universally true no matter what receiver you're working with. Most receivers, the way that's going to be done is with a bind button that is on the receiver. Here's the little button here, and if you very carefully push it, you'll, you'll kind of hear it click and feel it depress. You want to be really careful with these little gold buttons here. This is just like a, a, a shave of metal, and it's very easy to accidentally like scrape it off if you're too rough with it. I'm going to press it carefully with the flat part of this thick... Uh, driver. You don't want to use something like a blade, a screwdriver tip, or something that could damage it. It's very easy to damage. On other receivers, the binding method may differ, especially spectrum receivers sometimes bind with a thing called a bind plug, where you plug a special plug into the receiver pins and power the receiver on. Exactly how to bind is not going to be a topic for this video. You may need to look up the documentation for your particular receiver. The problem I'm having right now is this is wrapped in some pretty thick heat shrink and I can't really tell if the receiver button is being pushed down. Let me try plugging in and see what the LEDs do. So when I plug in normally on this receiver, the red LED comes on and it blinks slowly and that indicates it is disconnected, but it is not in binding mode. The way you put FreeSky receivers into binding mode is you hold down the button and then you plug in the battery. Yeah, and, and then you... You really need three hands to do it. It's kind of annoying. But having held down the button and plugged in the battery, you can see that now on this receiver, it's a little difficult for you to see, but there's a red and a green light, and they are solid. On this receiver, that's how it indicates, and that's true for most FreeSky receivers, but that's how it indicates it's in binding mode. I'm going to go and highlight bind, and I'm going to hit bind, and when I do that, you should see this light begin to flash. And the red light begins blinking. That indicates that binding has occurred. It's also very important that you set the fail-safe mode. Fail-safe is what the receiver will do if, like, this transmitter turns off because your battery died or if you fly out of range. It's very important that fail-safe mode be set to no pulses. This is critical. So let's, let's play this example forward. Hmm, I've been having some fun with this beta FPV. Now I've bought a new quadcopter. I'm going to try five inches. When I go to bind this quad to the radio... I'm not going to create a new model. I'm just going to come right here. I'm going to leave my receiver number alone. I'm just going to go here and I'm going to go bind. And I'm going to bind this one to receiver number two. Bind this one to receiver number two, just like I did the other one. See? They're all just going to be receiver number two. How can they all be receiver number two? It's like it's a, it's like it's a bin. See what I mean? It's not a spot. It's a bin. All the receivers go in the bin. The rest of this setup is going to involve the use of your computer. If you hate computers, this is not the hobby for you. And this quadcopter is configured using a piece of software called Betaflight Configurator. I have a video all about how to download and install Betaflight Configurator. That's linked down in the video description, along with a whole bunch of other helpful videos and a whole playlist of videos about setting up your Jumper T16. If you just got your Jumper T16, you pulled it out of the box, and then you're doing this video, you actually missed a step. There's some initial setup you need to do on your Jumper T16 that you're going to Go check out the playlist down in the video description, and you may want to pause this video and go get Betaflight installed if you haven't done that already. Now right here I can see that my receiver is not lit up. Some flight controllers will power the receiver when you plug in USB, and some will not, so this seems to be one that does not. So I'm going to go ahead and plug in a battery. Make sure your props are off anytime you plug in a battery when you're working on the quad on the bench. Have your props off. And now I can see, yes, the receiver is powered up. And there's a nice green light there indicating that it is 
it's bound and talking to the jumper. Then I'm gonna to go to the receiver tab in Betaflight and what I should see is that when I move the sticks on the radio, the channels move here in the receiver tab. And the first thing I'm gonna to wanna to check is my channel mapping. And that means that the correct channel moves for the control that I'm moving. There are several different standard layouts of controls on an RC transmitter, but most of the people watching this video and most of the people in the world probably use mode two. And what that means is that throttle is the left stick up and down. And we can see right here that that is in fact throttle that's moving. Yaw is the left stick left and right. And in fact, we can see that that is not correct. That is roll. Okay, so we'll remember that roll is not right. Correct, not correct. Pitch is going to be the right stick up and down. And roll is going to be the right stick left and right. And so we can see that what's going on with this particular quadcopter is that roll and yaw are reversed with each other. They're swapped. Here's how we fix that. Over here in the channel map, that line starts with four letters, A, E, T, R, and those letters correspond to these letters over here. The order that these come in is A, E, T, R. We want to swap roll, which is A. Why is it A and not R? It's A for aileron on an airplane, aileron. We don't, this isn't an airplane. It doesn't have ailerons. Okay. <laughs> But we want to swap roll, which is A, and yaw, which is R for rudder, which of course we also don't have. So we're going to take the A and the R and swap them. We're going to change this from A-E-T-R to R-E-T-A. And in fact, if we just look in this pull down, that actually may be one of the standard. Nope, it isn't. Nope. Okay, well, we'll just do that. R-E-T-A. One, two, three, four, and hit save. And having done that, we should now see that yaw is on the left stick and roll is on the right stick. And that's what we want to see. So once you've got your controls moving correctly, the next thing that you need to do is set your endpoints. This is a step that a lot of beginners skip, but it's a very important step uh, to getting the quadcopter to fly consistently and correctly. And what you're going to do is you're going to move the sticks all the way down and all the way up. And we can see when I move it all the way up, the throttle is at 2011. When I move it all the way down, the throttle is at 987. I'm going to press and hold the model key, and then I'm going to page all the way to the outputs screen, and this is where I'm going to fix this. So here in the output screen, I'm going to move the throttle, and I want you to look here. There's an arrow that will move and will tell me which channel is moving. You see that as I move the throttle up and down, this arrow moves back and forth. That tells me that that is channel 3. I'm going to scroll down to channel three and click the wheel one time. I'm going to scroll to the left or to the right. I'm going to highlight this column and you'll see right here it says min. That means this is the minimum value for channel three. And this one here is labeled max. That's the max value for channel three. So I'm going to put the throttle all the way down. I'm going to highlight min and click the wheel once so that it blinks. And now I'm going to look at the throttle channel and you can see the value here is 987. I'm going to move the wheel and as I do that, that value will come up. And I'm going to just keep rolling up until we get to 1000. I'm then going to go to the max. I'm going to put the throttle all the way at the maximum. It reads 2011. I'm going to click the wheel and I'm going to adjust the max column downwards until it reads 2000. And now my throttle, when I go up and down, reads 1,000 to 2,000. Now I've got to do that for all four of the channels. So I'm going to hit the return key one time to back out. So I'm no longer adjusting channel three. I'm going to roll up to channel, let's see, let's do the yaw channel next. So if I move the yaw stick left and right, I can see that this arrow is moving on channel one. So yaw is channel one. I'm going to click the wheel one time and roll over to the min column. Click the wheel one time so that the value is flashing. I'm going to hold the yaw stick all the way to the left, and we can see that the yaw channel is value 987. I'm going to roll that wheel until it gets up to 1,000. And I'm going to move it all the way to the right. I'm going to scroll over to the max column, and I'm going to roll that wheel until it comes down to 2,000. Okay. Now I'm going to do that for the remaining two channels over here on the right stick, the pitch and the roll channel. And now I've got my endpoint set correctly. 
the channels all go from 2,000 to 1,000, 1,000 to 2,000, 2,000 to 1,000, 1,000 to 2,000. My endpoints are set correctly. The other thing I need to do is adjust my channel centers. And in this case, the, the centers are all absolutely correct. We want to see the channel centering at 1,500. That doesn't matter so much for the throttle because the throttle is not spring-loaded. It doesn't really have a center. But for the other channels, if they are not centered at 1,500, you're going to use your trim switches to adjust them. And you can see as I move the trim up, the channel center is moving up. And I move the trim down, the channel center is moving down. Here's the key. Once you've got the trims adjusted, so the channels center at 1,500, what I want you to do is go all the way down to the bottom of the screen where you just go go to the top and go up and it'll scroll through. Highlight this trims to sub trims and hit click one time so it beeps. And that will adjust the sub trims so all your channels are centered. You always want your trim center. You always want your trims centered, but the trim switches are a convenient way to enter the sub trim and we just do trims to sub trims and that will keep our channels correctly centered. Now that we've set our endpoints correctly there are a couple little tweaks we can make that will help the quadcopter fly better. And I'm not going to go into a super lot of detail about what those are because I kind of just want to get you through this. But, but here's what you want to do. Adjust the stick low threshold from the default value of 1050 to 1005. And adjust the stick high threshold from the default value of 1900 to 1995. And save. The next thing we need to do is set up our aux modes. Aux modes are auxiliary functions and that kind of makes it sound like they're optional, but they're really not. Well, some of them aren't. For example, the arming mode has to be activated before the quadcopter will fly. If you want the quadcopter to fly in auto level mode, so it levels itself back out when you send to the sticks, you'll need to set that up as an aux mode and so forth. Let me show you how to do that. Hey there, I'm Joshua from the future. If you haven't met me in one of Joshua's previous videos, I come from the future to correct mistakes that Joshua in the past made. I'm much smarter than him. He screws up a lot. In just a second, Joshua is going to tell you to delete all your aux modes. And for most of you, that's fine. But there are a few quadcopters that ship with an unusual aux mode configured that we won't cover. And if you don't, if you don't note that, your quadcopter may not work right. Specifically, what I want you to do is scroll in your aux, uh, in, your, in your modes tab. And I want you to look to see if you have a VTX pit mode configured, or there may be a mode there named user one. I don't actually have that one. If you have VTX pit mode or user one configured, don't delete it. Just leave it exactly like it is. On with the show. Aux modes are set up in the modes tab in Betaflight and this quadcopter has shipped from the factory with some aux modes pre-configured. But we're just going to start from scratch because we don't, it's easier to just start from scratch and make the aux modes match your radio than to like try to make your radio match the aux modes. So the first thing I want to do is I just want to delete any existing aux modes that are in the modes tab and hit save. They're gone. Don't worry. Don't worry. It'll be okay. We're going to set them back up again. First mode we're going to need to set up is an arming mode. Without an arming mode, the quadcopter will not fly. Arm is how you, it's like putting the key in your car, turn the ignition. So we're going to go to the arm mode and we're going to hit add range. And as soon as we do that, all the other modes will disappear because this hide unused modes tech option is enabled. Let's just disable that so we can see all the modes while we set it up. The next thing you're going to want to do is choose a switch on the transmitter that you're going to use to arm the quadcopter. This is an important decision. Again, it's like putting the key in the ignition of your car. When the quadcopter, you really need to be able to arm and disarm the quad exactly when you want to and only when you want to. So I like to use this big left two position switch. See, two position, one for arm, one for disarm. Some people like to use a three position switch and they'll do arm and angle mode, for example. Uh, there's various ways you can set it up. I'm going to suggest you use this two position switch here on the back. Now stay right where you are, but watch me. If I go to the receiver screen and... I move that switch. Notice that none of my channels, none of the aux channels are moving. This switch doesn't do anything. The switches on the radio don't do anything until you tell them what to do. It's a lot of power, but it's also a lot of responsibility, like Spider-Man, right? <laughs> so we need to tell the Jumper T16 that you want this switch to make a certain channel move. And here's how we do that. I'm gonna hold down the model key and I'm gonna page to the mixer screen. I'm going to roll down to whichever channel I want to have that switch affect. And it doesn't really matter which one you pick, but 
I'm just going to pick channel 5 since that's the first one. Notice that channels 1 through 4 are used for the rudder, elevator, throttle, and aileron. So we're just going to pick channel 5. I'm going to click one time, and that will create a new mixer line. A mixer line is what's used to cause a certain control to affect a certain channel. I can name my mixer lines to help me remember what they do. I'm going to name this one arm. So I'm going to highlight the source parameter and click the button one time so it begins flashing. And then I could scroll through this list to find the switch that I want, but there's a much easier way. While it's flashing, I'm just going to move the switch one time. And that will fill in that switch as the source for this mixer line. And then I'm going to hit return. And that's all I have to do. Now, when I move the switch, notice that channel 5, aux 1, moves up and down. Once that's happening, we can finish setting up our arming mode. Now, I clicked away from the modes tab, so my arming mode has disappeared. If you stayed on the modes tab, yours is still there. If you clicked away, now you just hit add range and it'll come back. And the next thing we want to do is we want to figure out which switch position should be armed and which switch position should be disarmed. And I'll tell you how I like to do it. I prefer to push the switch away to arm and pull the switch towards to disarm. And the reason for that is that if you... If you're flying, your hand is like this, right? And when you go to disarm, you just put your finger up and you just kind of, okay, I got it. To arm, you have to kind of come around the switch to the front of the switch and flip it away. And that's a little bit of a slower motion. I would like to be able to disarm as quickly as possible, whereas the arming is a little bit more of a delicate and and natural, I don't know, motion. The other thing is that while I'm flying, I rest my finger right here in between the two switches with a little bit of pressure. Actually, I rest this finger because I fly with this finger. But I just rest that finger on the arming switch with a little bit of pressure pushing it away. And then when I go to disarm, I just, I can just pull it toward me. So I like to have the switch like that. If you feel like, if you feel differently, you can do it the other way. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the switch in the armed position whichever position I want to use. And then I'm going to look at this little yellow tick mark. And notice that as I flip the switch, this little yellow tick mark moves up and down. It's showing me the current channel position. I'm going to put the switch in the armed position. I'm going to move this slider down so that it is on top of the armed position. I'm going to hit Save. And at that point, this option turns red. Arming is disabled while we're plugged into the computer for safety. But if I flip the switch, we can see that the arming mode now turns on and off. That, that mode is set up correctly. That is how you set up aux modes. It's very simple. And we can do that for all of the other aux modes that we're going to use. Let's set up a couple more. Angle mode is what causes the quadcopter to auto level. If you want to fly an auto level mode where when you center the stick, the quadcopter levels back out again. If you're coming from like a, a toy quadcopter or a DJI, that's probably similar to what you're used to. Angle mode, to set that up, we'll hit add range. And the switch I prefer to use for angle mode is the front right three position switch. That's just where I've always put it and where I probably always will because now my muscle memory is trained that way. What we're gonna do is we're in the mixer screen. We're gonna go down to channel six and we need to tell the radio that channel six is controlled by this switch. We'll do that by highlighting channel six, click the mouse one time, and I'm gonna highlight source, press one time so it blinks, and then I'm gonna move that switch, and it will fill in SD. And now, if we look at this little yellow tick mark, we can see that as I move the switch, that little yellow tick mark moves. We also need to set this, this is which channel is controlling this mode, but it actually auto detects as I move. If, it's, if, the, if you see that this is not moving when you move the switch, you may have the wrong channel selected. Um, so channel five is aux one, channel six is aux two, channel seven is aux three, and so on. If you accidentally somehow have the wrong thing selected here, then you won't see this tick mark moving. So aux two select. Okay, so right now the way it's set up is that angle mode will act, oh, I gotta hit save. There we go. Right now, the way it's set up is that angle mode is active when I put that switch in the middle position, and it's inactive when I have the switch either in the high or the low position. Do you like that? If you don't like it, if you want it some, let's say you want um, angle mode to be active when the switch is in the up position. The standard way that most transmitters are set is that the switches 
pushed up and away is like the default position when you turn the radio on. You just you just make a habit of doing that. So maybe you want angle mode to be on by default. So you would move that down here. I tend to fly in acro mode, so I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to leave this in its default position. Another mode that's nice to set up is the beeper mode. This causes the quad to beep when you activate the mode, and it can be helpful if you've crashed your quad in like the tall grass and you don't know where it is. So I'm going to add a beeper mode. I like to put the beeper on this momentary switch on the right side, so I can just kind of pull the switch and have it beep for a second and then, um, then just let release it. So I'm going to do the exact same thing that I did before. I'm going to use channel 7 here. I'm going to choose the source, make it blink. I'm going to move the switch. And now that's filled in. Aux 3, channel 7, has been auto-detected. And now when I move that switch, that little yellow tick mark moves. So the default position is going to be not beeping. That's down here. When I pull the switch, it's going to beep, and that's going to be up here, so I'm just going to drag that over. So it covers the tick mark and hit save. Oh, and it's already working. Fantastic. There's one more mode that is very, very worth setting up, and that is flip over after crash mode. Some quadcopters won't have this mode, but most modern ones should. What flip over after crash mode, it's called turtle mode, because like a turtle on its back, a quadcopter crashes and it's upside down, it can't turn back over again and you have to walk and pick it up and nobody wants that. Turtle mode reverses the motors so the quadcopter can flip itself over if you crash upside down. It's also super useful for getting quadcopters out of trees because you can kind of twist the quadcopter around by... Anyway, I've got a video about what turtle mode is and how to use it, but you, if you have a quad, you definitely want to set up turtle mode. So I'm going to set up flip over after crash mode. I'm going to hit add range. And in this case, I'm not going to add another mix, another, another aux channel. In fact, I'm, I've only got one more aux channel. Instead, what I'm going to do, let me just clean the screen up by enabling hide unused modes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move this switch which is tied to aux2. And you can see that when I move that switch, aux2 has been auto-detected, okay? Now we said that the middle position for aux2 is gonna be angle mode, but we haven't assigned any function to the down position. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put flip crash on the down position of aux2 with angle mode in the middle position of aux2 and then just regular acro mode, just nothing on the up position of aux2. And this would be pretty much the basic configuration I would set up for almost all of my quads. Some of them may have a few additional functions, but this is basically my starting point for my for my switch modes. I can do everything. I, I can arm, I can disarm. If I want auto level for some reason, I, I don't, typically don't fly that way, but if I want it, it's there. I can beep so I can find my quad after a crash, and I can use turtle mode to flip my quad over and fly home or get it out of a tree. Now, there are a few other little things that I'm going to walk you through to complete the setup of this model. One of them is the switch position warning. So when you first turn the radio on, if any of the switches are not in there, like it was in your backpack and the switch got bumped, if they're not in their pre-approved position, the radio will warn you and will refuse to start up. That's to protect you. If the arming switch was in the wrong position and you power the radio up, the quadcopter could arm unexpectedly. But... We've now set these switches up so, well, especially we've changed the arm switch. The, the, the arm is forward and disarm is, is towards us, and that's not what the radio is expecting. The radio expects the switches by default to all be pushed up and away. So let's tell the radio what the new default switch positions are. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to push all the switches up and away, except for the arming switch, which I'm going to put in the disarm position. For me, that's towards. I'm going to hold down the model key and I'm going to scroll down to the switch positions here. I'm going to highlight the switch positions and I'm just going to long press and it's going to fill in the current switch positions as the sort of default safe positions. And at this point, you are done. The model is set up and you're ready to go. Well, I mean, you got to like put your props on your quad and stuff, but you're basically ready to go fly. Now that you've set this model up, you don't have to change it anymore for all the future quads that you own as long as they have a FreeSky D16 receiver like the XM Plus or the RXSR. If you do get a quad with a different type of receiver for any reason, just make a brand new model or in fact, 
you can copy this model from the model select screen. Just long press on this model and copy model will be an option. You can just copy this one and then go in and change the receiver the type from FreeSky D16 to whatever the appropriate receiver type is for that new radio. And then you've got a, your second model is basically ready to go. You will want to check the endpoints on any new models you get. If you're using modern serial receivers, the endpoints should be consistent across all the models and you shouldn't need to tweak them. But if you go from like a FreeSky to a FlySky or a Spectrum receiver, you almost certainly will need to tweak those endpoints. But once you've got those set, they should be pretty good for all the other. Once you've got your Spectrum endpoint set on your Spectrum model, then you won't have to change those endpoints for any future Spectrum receivers. Life will be a lot simpler if you just stick to one kind of receiver, but that's not always possible and it's not that big a deal. There is a lot more we could teach about OpenTX and Betaflight, but for now, we're going to bring this video to a close. There are way more resources down in the video description. There's my this playlist about the Jumper T16 and getting it set. Did you not have, remember the voice callouts I had where it said trim centered? Did you not have that? You know, when it powers up, does it say, welcome to Jumper TX? If you don't have all those voice callouts, there's that, that, check my Jumper T16 playlist with all the instructions for setting up the Jumper T16. And I also have a Betaflight playlist that is linked in the video description to start teaching you more things about Betaflight if you, uh, you want to learn about that. That's going to bring us to the end of the video, though. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Joshua Bardwell, and happy flying to you.